Hi, uh, I'm Ching Wei, and well, thanks for the introduction. And today I'm gonna talk about autoregression models and normalizing flows. And these are two very famous, like popular uh, journey models that are used in deep learning. And we can also use these models for density estimation kind of tasks. So um, just a little bit of history, like uh, journey, model, uh, journey modeling has a very long, long history in terms of its name. Like in the past, people uh, contrasted uh, by um, what is known as the discriminant learning, uh, which is simply just modeling the conditional distribution, uh, well, like a classifier or regression task. So given the input x, we want to model the conditional distribution p of y given x. And we are interested in the general mapping, like whether it's linear or nonlinear. And uh, in contrast, uh, people, people also care about the joint probability of, of both the input and output. So p of x and y, so this is a joint probability. And we want to model how the data are generated. So that's why it's called the journey learning. And uh, so why do we care about it? Why do we want to model the, the, the distribution of the, uh, the joint distribution of the data? Because like, there are many benefits for sure. So the first thing is that um, if we're able to model density, the, the likelihood of the data under our model, we can use it as a method to evaluate our, our, our methods. And uh, for instance, if you look at the, the figure over here, uh, you see that, let's say, the, the blue dots here are uh, the, the true data samples. Let's assume it, it's, it comes from some sort of data manifold. And uh, the, the red dots here, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't come from the same data manifold. So we can use this kind of method to, to, you know, to model, the, model the distribution of the data. And we, we're going to assign high likelihood to the true data. And we're going to assign low likelihood to, to the fake data. So we can use these kind of uh, methods uh, for, for anonymity de detection kind of past. And another benefit of uh, modeling joint distribution is that we can, we can sample from this distribution. So like people are usually interested in uh, generating images like, uh, that, that has high quality in terms of uh, generation. For instance, we want to pass uniform samples through a generator usually defined by a neural net. And at the end, uh, the output is going to be like images that looks like this. OK? So just a bit of terminology. Uh, so this is like a, a tutorial given by Yang Fellow in 2016. And uh, uh, the mainstream method to learn a joint distribution is what is known as the maximum likelihood principle. And uh, usually we would like to define a, uh, li uh, the likelihood the density of the joint distribution. And uh, so we're going to focus on the left part of the tree. And more specifically, we're going to talk about uh, likelihood that, are, uh, that is tractable. Specifically, there are two kinds of likelihood that, that is tractable nowadays. Uh, the first one is autoregression models, which is the fully visible belief nets, uh, like MAID, pixel RNN, pixel CNN, which we're going to talk about later. And then the second part is what is known as the change of variable models, or uh, normalizing flows. OK? So for journey models, we care about a few properties. Before we start, we're going to just mention a few terms. Uh, for instance, when we talk about you know, using things like deep, deep learning, deep models, uh, usually we want to throw in a lot of capacity, model capacity, like the deeper the better, the wider the better. And when, usually when, when things get more complicated, more complex, it is harder in general to track the likelihood of the, of the data under our model. Okay? So there's like a trade-off, implicit trade-off between model complexity and tractability of the likelihood. Okay? And uh, even if it's not tractable, for instance, we need to approxi approximate the likelihood. We want to uh, know whether uh, you know, our approximation method is accurate enough. And uh, when, we want to, when we evaluate our, 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 our model in terms of the test likelihood, test data sets likelihood, we want to know whether it's fast to, to, to evaluate the, the, the model. And uh, we also talked about a benefit of modeling the joint distribution is that we can sample from this distribution. So whether this kind of methods uh, well allow allow us to sample in a very efficient way, that's also one question we want to ask. And also, uh, people you know nowadays uh, GANs are very popular techniques. So we care about whether we can generate very high quality images as well. And the last part is uh, for linear, for journey models that has some sort of you know that can give you some sort of representation of your, of your data. For instance, you can use these kind of things to compress, um, and then you can regenerate from, from your, your some sort of encoder or decoder. 
Okay, so today's talk is going to be divided into three parts. The first part is going to be the algorithm models, and uh, we're going to talk about change of variable models in the second part, and in the last part, we're going to combine the two things and see how we can improve the model. Okay, so this is a very generic formula, uh, which is known as the, ch uh, what is it? Chain rule of probability, okay? Uh, so the x over here is a vector, so it repre represents multiple entries, like x1 to xm, and uh, gen generally, the, the, the joint probability can be decomposed into a product of conditional distributions, which is written over here. So in a, in a bivariate case, we can write a p of x1 and x2 into two parts, which is the marginal probability of x1 and the conditional probability of x2 given x1. Okay, so th this is like, the, the ordering here is, is chosen arbitrarily. You can choose any kind of ordering. So by decompose, de decomposing the joint probability into a product of, of condi conditionals, we are not making any assumption. So here there's no modeling at all, okay? So let's look at the figure over here. What this conditional probability is saying is that we're gonna take a slice over here, okay? So this is x1 being some value, okay? And we take a slice over the joint probability and we are gonna look at the density over this axis, okay? So this is the conditional of x2 given x1 for a real uh, random variable. So for a tabular case, a tabular case is when you can uh, enumerate all the possible, possible values of your random variable. For instance, if your random variable is binary, uh, you can use zero and ones in code your data. So uh, for low, low dimensional, let's say we have two dimensional uh, problem and a binary data set, let's say, uh, we can decompose the joint probability into four values, okay? So these are the, these are the joint probabilities, okay? So uh, reading in the parenthesis here are the conditional probability of x2 given x1. So here, for instance, uh, the marginal probability of x1 taking the first value, this is the second value, taking the first value is 0 0.3. And uh, the conditional probability of x2 given x1 being the first value, x2 also being the first value is 0 0.2, okay? So by the chain rule over here, we know that the joint probability of x1 and x2 both being the first value is 0 0.2 times 0 0.3, which is 0 0.06, okay? Easy breezy. So uh, what's the problem right now? The problem right now is, uh, let's say, now we only have two random variables. It only, we only have two dimensions. What happens, we have a highly uh, multivariate problems like images. Let's say we want to model the joint distribution of images. Let's say it's like 32 by 32, three colors, so by three, so that's 1,000. And uh, let's say each pixel is gonna take on values that ranges from zero to 255. So the number of probability we need to keep track of is gonna be 255, uh, 256 to the power of 1,000. That's problematic, because now we have a problem of dimensionality, okay? So we cannot simply just na naively just model the joint probability as a table, because it's gonna be a gigantic table. We cannot check, the, check, check each cell easily. So what we wanna, what, what, what we wanna do here is we want to model, uh, we want to make some assumption to compress this table, okay? Using some sort of parametric method, which is well, what we're gonna call deep learning right now. Uh, so what are we gonna do here is we want to model the conditional probability here. Using a deep neural net. Deep neural net. Hi. Okay, so the pi t over here denotes a neural network. Okay, so we're gonna use a neural net, let's say something like RNNs, to, to parameterize the conditional probability of xt given the preceding random variables. 
So here it's going to take in xt to xt, uh, xt minus 1 as input, and it's going to output the parameters of the conditional probability. Okay? For instance, if it's binary, we are simply going to learn the, the mean parameter of the Bernoulli distribution. If it's uh, real data, let's assume this is like Gaussian, for instance. We can assume this is Gaussian. Then the sufficient statistic of a Gaussian distribution is simply just a mu and sigma, the mean and standard deviation of the Gaussian. Okay? So these two are going to be parameterized by our neural nets, for instance. Okay? So uh, we want to introduce some, some clever way to parameterize the conditional probability because, you know, like if we, use, if we simply use a iron here, uh, it's going to be, it's going to have a thousand layers, which is, you know, not very good because it's too big. And we can use things like ConfNet, which has a better inductive bias for um, natural images, for instance. And so let's look at the first ex example right now. Um, so the first example here is, is developed by Mathieu Jacquemin in 2015 uh, called MADE. Okay? So MADE is a clever way to combine autoencoder with MAST. So we're going to apply a MAST on the weight parameter of the, of the neural nets. Okay? So what is an autoencoder? Like, do you know, like people who know about autoencoder, raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to give you the wiki definition of autoencoder. An autoencoder is a type of neural net that is used to learn efficient data encodings, which is representation in a super unsupervised manner. Okay? Like, usually the way we train an autoencoder is that we have an encoder, encoder, and we encode the data. Okay? So this is a neural net. Okay? And we have a decoder. Okay, so we have a latent code here, and we decode it. Okay, and we simply minimize the reconstruction loss. This is known as the reconstruction loss, like for instance L2 loss of the model. Okay, so what it's doing is simply that we 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 encode the data into latent space, and after we we decode it, we want the model, which is the encoder and decoder, to give us like low reconstruction loss. Okay, so we can compress the data. Let's say if the dimension here is high, like like a thousand or three thousand for natural images, and let's say we can encode it into a lower dimensional uh, representation, like thirty-two by sixty-four, which is more easy uh, easier to, to manipulate. Okay, so the the idea of made is that it combines autoencoder with mask auto, like mask operation. Okay. So if you look at the figure over here, let's say here there's like a three by four dot product, which is just a linear operation, okay? So we map this three-dimensional object to a four-dimensional object, like just, uh, yeah, dot product. And um, we're gonna apply a mask, okay? So the black, cell, the black cells here represent zero, the white ones represent one, okay? So if we apply this to the, to the weight parameter of the first layer, we see that, let's say, the first column here are all zeros, okay? So that means there's no connectivity between the first hidden unit of the second hidden layer and the first layer. They are all masked out, all right? And uh, for this one, we know that this is the second hidden unit. It is not connected to the third unit of the input layer, okay? So if we apply multiple layers of this kind of masked dot product, we see that, for instance, the second unit at the output is not connected to any of the inputs. Okay? So we, we can model the marginal probability of x2 here. And we see that for the first unit, it is connected to all of the, all of the other random variables. So we can model the conditional probability of x1 given both x2 and x3. Okay, so we can use this mask operation to enforce the autoregressive property of autoregressive model. Okay, so usually the way it's done is we encode our, 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 our data into a latent code and we decode it and we maximize the likelihood of the, of the output. All right, so for instance, uh, the output is going to be the mean parameter of the Bernoulli distribution and we simply just mix, mi uh, minimize the cross entropy. All right. 
And uh, here's an example for a binarized MNIST. So if we maximize the likelihood and at the end of the training, we simply just sample from this model, like sequentially. For instance, here we're gonna sample X2 first. And let's say it has a like um, and a probability of 0.8, so with probability 0.8, we're gonna sample one. With probability 0.2, we're gonna sample zero. Okay? And then let's say if we got one, we fix one as, as the second pixel, and then we take it back and encode it again and get the third pixel, let's say uh, the, 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 val the probability is 0.4. With probability 0.4, we're gonna get one, and 0.6 is gonna get zero, okay? And, and so on and so forth. So you can easily tell that one, one problem of this kind of model is that uh, sampling is sequential, so we can uh, scale up in terms of uh, efficiency uh, of the sampling process. And uh, this is like a generic method to, to, to build an autogress model, because we are not assuming, you know, this is simply just feed forward network. This is not convolutional network, okay? So the next thing we're gonna talk about is what is known as pixel CNN because like, ConfNet has a very good you know, inductive bias for natural images, as we all know. Uh, so what, is, what it is doing is that uh, we're gonna, so in the previous example, we are now assuming we know the, the, the ordering of the, of, the, of the data, but here we know we are, we are modeling natural images. So we're gonna make use of, make use of this, um, this information. Uh, so let's say these, these are just um, pixel of the, of the natural images. And uh, we are going to model the, the joint probability as a product of distribution, uh, conditional distributions. So let's say this is xt. We are going to uh, build a neural net that gives us the parameter of the conditional distribution xt given the preceding uh, pixels. Okay. So what 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 like? Let's just think about it. Like how how are we going to like parameterize a neural net that takes in the preceding pixels as input and output? the parameter of you know, this condition distribution, all right? And the way it's done in a paper, pixel CNN, well, actually it's called pixel recurrent neural nets, weirdly, um, is that they use a kind of masked, as well, a masked convolution operation. So uh, let's say we have a three by three receptive field Okay, just deploying 101 uh, ConfNet, well, maybe 102. Um, we're gonna simply just apply this mask to the kernel, okay? So we know that if we simply just multiply this element-wise uh, by, by the kernel that we have, like, a per, like the, the weight parameter of the kernel, uh, we are gonna only have access to the preceding random variable here, whereas the information that follows will be masked out, okay? So by applying this kind of mask convolution of operation, we're able to enforce the autoaggressive property just like made, all right? And uh, another thing they, they, they talked about is that, you know, for, for images, uh, we sort of think of it as a continuous um, random variable, like pixel uh, can, can, can take on value of zero to 256, and if we can rescale it to, to, be, uh, to values between zero and one as well. But they, they simply just model as a multi, uh, multinomial categorical di distribution. So uh, it can induce some sort of multimodality uh, which cannot be modeled by things like a Gaussian distribution, okay? Uh, for instance, let's say the true conditional distribution looks like this. And if we simply just use a Gaussian, we're gonna end up with something that look, looks like this. But if we discretize it, we can use the softmax outputs to model this shape of distribution more accurately. And that's one of the things they introduced in the paper. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, another related paper, which is conditional generation using pixel CNN, is that they, they realize if they simply just use this kind of mass convolutional, convolutional operation, uh, like if you propagate the information from this pixel to this one, like there's also another mask for this pixel, right? So if you, let's say for the preview, previous layer, you're gonna propagate the information from here to here, but not from here to here, okay? So if you just stack multiple layers of contents with masks, you're gonna realize that 
there is a blind spot in this region. So you're, you're never going to propagate information from this blind spot to this pixel. Okay, so this is like a limitation of pixel CNN, the vanilla pixel CNN. And uh, they introduce what is known as the vertical stack to propagate the information downwards and use this horizontal stack to propagate the information left, rightward. Okay, so with this kind of operation, there's no blind stop spots. So this is simply just another variant of pixel CNN. And a third variant of pixel CNN is introduced by OpenAI, I believe, or Berkeley. OpenAI, okay. Um, they use a sort of unit structure. So unit structure is autoencoder structure with skip connection, okay? So we can simply skip all the layers through to the last layer. Well, up to, in terms of optimization, the gradient here is shorter. Well, gradient path here is shorter, so it's easier to optimize. You won't have the vanishing gradient problem. And uh, they introduce a downsampling in pixel CNN. So you go from 32 by 32 to 8 by 8. Okay? So when you do these kind of things, when you apply the mask autoaggressive, well, mask convolution of operation here, you can model more long term dependency between your pixels. Okay? That's the rationale between, uh, behind this uh, architecture. So they, they introduced the skip connection like UNET, and they uh, downsample the, the pixel to a lower uh, resolution version of the images. So just a bit of demonstration of what it can do. Uh, so here, uh, they, they model pixel CNN on CIFAR 10, and they, they generate samples in, well, that's like two years ago. So we can see that uh, we are able to generate, well, decent-ish samples of CIFAR. And uh, for instance, I think that is a horrors. Because um, like my supervisor usually thinks that when your model is able to generate horses, it's a good model. So I think that's definitely a horse. And uh, yeah, so these are the real data as a comparison. All right, uh, a bit of evaluation. So like I said before, if we define an explicit likelihood model, we're able to evaluate our model in terms of likelihood on the test set. So just like any other machine learning task, we have a training set, we have a validation set, we have a test set. So we train up our model on the training set, we maximize the training set's likelihood under our model, we tune the hyperparameter of our model using the validation set, and then we evaluate our model using the test set. So we, we just simply look at the likelihood of the test data under our model. And here it's the likelihood of the, of the uh, amnest, just uh, FYI here, this is a maid, uh, which I talked about just a few, lies, a few slides ago, uh, which has around 80, 86. Uh, I think this is a negative log likelihood. And with pixel CNN, we're able to get to around 81. And that's the, the rest is like the, the other models they introduced in the paper as well. And uh, for CIFAR 10, it is also negative log likelihood. Um, so NICE is a method that we're going to talk about in the, following of, in the following part of the talk. Uh, we are able to use NICE to get to around 4.5 compared to 4.7, which is simply just a Gaussian distribution. So you might be, you might be surprised that we are able to model you know, highly multivariate data uh, using simply just multivariate Gaussian. Okay? But there's like, a problem with it. Okay? Um, I think like, in, in the past, when people do these kind of things compared, compared to Gaussian distribution, they realize that it's harder to optimize this kind of explicit um, likelihood methods. And uh, think about it, if you, if you have a data look, that looks like this, the blue dots over there, and if you model it using a Gaussian distribution, you're gonna just throw a, a bunch of probability mass around the mean of the data. And uh, you are not able to capture the multimodality and the nonlinearity in your data manifold. So that's why we want to use something that as flexible as a neural net to model the likelihood of the data, okay? But, Quite disappointingly, we are only able to outperform Gaussian distribution by a you know, marginal amount. But with pixel CNN, we see that uh, we can, we can you know, just decrease the negative likelihood to up to 3 or 3.1. Uh, I think it's bits per pixel. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's move on. And uh, the third uh, architecture I'm going to talk about today is known as the pixel snail. So it is also an autoregressive model. 
and uh, they improve on pixel CN um, by, t by using this attention mechanism. So the lab part of it is simply just pixel, pixel CNN. So we use this kind of causal convolution, which is mask with convolution. With this causal convolution, we're able to enforce the autoregressive property of the layer over here. Okay, so for each pixel over here, uh, it is also it, it is only conditional on the preceding, preceding, preceding pixels. There's no mixing with the following pixel. And then instead of just stacking multiple layers of this, we introduce a attention mechanism. Okay, so this is also known as the image transformer in another parallel work. So here we simply take the matrix multiplication with a softmax and the input. Okay, so it is simply just a weighted sum of the preceding pixel values. Okay, so by doing this, we're able to propagate the information of the preceding, preceding pixels more efficiently. We don't need to wait until you know, 10 layers of convolutional uh, layers to, to, to have access to the first pixel if we're at the end. Okay, by, by taking one layer of softmax, we're able to mix it just in one step. All right, so the, this is what I introduced in the paper. And when we compare to, uh, okay, there's no comparison here. It's simply just an unconditional generation of, of uh, CIFAR-10 and ImageNet. So here we see that uh, the samples we get here for CIFAR is much better compared to Pixel CNN. There's no, well, no artifacts compared to Pixel CNN samples. Here we see that the, the texture here is more smooth, and uh, yeah, the the things that we generate are much better. And these are examples for ImageNet. And uh, as a comparison, if we compare, compare to Pixel CNN++, which is one of the variants I talked about, uh, we see that this is conditional generation. So we, we, uh, we, give imp we give the label as an input. And each row over here is one class. And each column over here is one class. OK? So we see that if we use Pixel CNN, uh, there's still some sort of artifact in the, in the generated samples. But in, in image transformer, which is Pixel Snail, uh, there's less artifacts, and these images look, well, I think it's better. So this is, these are uh, vis like visual inspection of the, of the model quality. OK, OK. So, so far, so good. Am I too fast? Any questions? OK, I'm going to win. All right. OK, the second part of the talk is going to be uh, about change of variable models. Or which is also known as normalizing flows. Uh, so what is change of variable? Okay, let's imagine you want to sample from a uh, Gaussian distribution. So that's normal distribution with center at zero with unit variance. Okay, so let's say we sample, we got this sample from this distribution, and let's do something. Let's multiply this sample's value by two. Okay, so y over there is two is two uh, x. Okay, so uh, because we're, we're doing you know, science. We want to be able to evaluate our models. So you might wonder what is the likelihood of the, of the what is the density okay, of the transformed sample. Okay? So naively, you might think that, okay, so the density of the output of the transformation, 2x, is simply the same density value of x. Okay? Think about it for a minute. Well, two seconds. OK, so if, if I simply just take the density of that to be the same as density of that, I'm going to end up with a PVF, the probability density function, that looks like this. OK, so what's the problem over here? If I integrate out the, pro the, the area under this curve, we're going to realize that this is sum to 1. OK, so this is a normal distribution, since it's a probability distribution, by the law of probability. The area under the curve here sums to one, but if you simply just take density of that to be the same as density of that, you end up with two instead of one. So it, it's not a proper probability distribution. So what we need to do over here is that we need to divide the density of the original sample by two, so that it looks like this. Okay. So the density of the transformed sample is actually the same as the previous of of the, of the pre-transformed sample divided by two. OK? Or more generally, we can define the change of variable formula for any kind of transformation, well, invertible transformation. Uh, so here, I use this 
f theta to transform x. Okay, in the previous example, we used two x. That's one kind of transformation. So as long as f theta here is invertible or one-to-one -one mapping, uh, let's say if we sample from an input-based distribution, we transform it, the, the density of the output sample is simply the input sample's density uh, multiplied by an amount that is inversely proportional to the Jacobian, well, determinant of the Jacobian of the transformation, okay? That sounds horrible, what does it mean? Um, so, over, so if we look at one uh, univariate uh, example over here, so this is the function f, okay? So let's say I sample from a Gaussian distribution, and uh, I get what sample under this area. When I transform it, I get something that, that ends up here, okay? The density here is the density here multiplied by the inverse of the gradient, okay? So what it says is that, let's say, the, the local area here is expanded because the gradient is larger, expanded by this function to here. We want, to, we want the volume here to be preserved, okay? So if I end up with a larger area, I need to push down the density because the gradient is larger, and I, I, want the, I want the volume here to be the same as the volume here, okay? So that at the end, if, if I integrate out this function, this, this density function, it still sums to one, okay? So that's basically what the change of variable, variable formula says. I want to have a method to evaluate the likelihood of, uh, to translate the likelihood between the samples, uh, like between the samples uh, before and after transformation, so that at the end, uh, it sort of self-normalizes the, the probability density, okay? So um, in terms of implementation, um, to, to evaluate this thing, this is for a multivariate case. This is just one, one dimension. So for multiple dimensions case, uh, we need to compute the determinant of the Jacobian matrix. So for people who are familiar with linear algebra, I hope there are some of you who are familiar with linear algebra, um, usually the operation of a determinant is, is all cubic. Okay, so this is mm, not very good. So the, 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 the previous research uh, has been trying to reduce the complexity of that to uh, linear time so that, so that you can evaluate the determinant in linear time more efficiently. All right, so just keep in mind, there is something we, are sac uh, we, we need to sacrifice here because we are limiting ourselves to a specific subfamily of all kinds of functions so that the Jacobian can be computed in linear time. Okay, so we are trading expressivity of the transformation for uh, efficiency in terms of uh, computation of a determinant. All right. Okay, just a little bit more math. <laughs> um, so this is like a, a way to construct a invertible, invertible transformation because, like I said, to compute the likelihood that way um, using the change of variable formula, you need the function to be invertible. So let's say uh, I have a multivariate uh, data. Uh, what happens here is that I'm gonna divide my input data into two parts. So these are the inputs. Okay, so I call this x i1. Okay, I call this x i2. Okay, imagine this is like pixel one to pixel four, pixel five to pixel seven. Okay, so what is written over there is that I simply define the identity mapping between x i1 and y i1. Okay, so dot, 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 dot. And uh, I define the transformation of the second part, x i2, to be an invertible function g over there, conditioned on x i1. So this is g. And from there, I get y i2. OK? There's a magic here. Uh, so if you look at the determinant, well, the Jacobian of this transformation, we see that because this is an invertible transformation, so the gradient of y i1 and uh, x i1 is simply just identity, okay? Because there's, no, there's nothing over there. So this is why we have a identity on this block, okay? And uh, 
we define the second part of transformation to be element-wise invertible, okay? So that this part is simply just, uh, well, that looks like this. I don't know what's happening here, but this part is simply just dy, uh, let's call it five, dx five, d y four, dy, dx four, four, et cetera. Okay, so we, s we see that there is some sort of structure in the Jacobian over here. The determinant of this thing, because these are simply z zero over here, the determinant is simply just a product of the entries on the diagonal, okay? So they are M of them. Let's say we have M dimensional data, and the, the computation of the Jacobian is simply scales linear with the number of dimensions instead of cubically, okay? And uh, one kind of coupling law, that, that is like a G is like a generic coupling law. That's defined G to be a additive transformation, okay? So let's erase this. <coughs> if G here is simply just Xi2 plus some value that depends on Xi1, then the, deter, uh, the derivative of y i2 with respect to x i2, this, the last line over here, is simply just one identity, okay? So what happens here is that after the transformation, the volume of the, the original area doesn't change at all. So that's a volume preserving transformation. So we don't need to compute the determinant of Jacobian. It's always a constant. Okay, and we can generalize this to a, a fine coupling law which introduces this scale transformation, okay? So this is the same as the shift transformation. I also have a scale transformation, and uh, uh, the derivative of the output with respect to the input is simply just the exponentiated something, okay? So, a computation of the determinant is still simply just linear time in terms of number of dimensions. All right, okay? I hope it's not too bad. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so here are some instantiations of the coupling laws that I just introduced. Uh, for natural images, um, like in this part, we talk about ways to, you know, to, 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 to construct a invertible map. And uh, here it depends on you know, partitioning of our inputs into two parts. And now I'm gonna talk about examples to partition uh, your data into two parts, okay? So for natural images, like by Lauren Ding in 2006, 17, they introduced two ways. The first way is this kind of checkerboard pattern, okay? We'll simply just apply mask in the input. So let's say I want my output, um, let's say the white pixels here are, uh, uh, partition two, the black one or partition one, okay? So uh, I simply just mask out the white ones before I apply the convolution, okay? So that it only depends on the black part. And at the output, output layer, uh, I mask out the black part so that I transform the white part. Th that easy, okay? And the second, the second kind of uh, uh, coupling uh, is channel-wise splitting. So I can divide my ch channel into two parts, like, as well. And uh, the transformation is simply the same thing. Like, I apply mask here in the input, and I apply mask here in the output. So that the white part is gonna be dependent on the second part, uh, the bl black part, okay? And this is, like, kind of, uh, I think it's kind of smart, because, like, for, for images, like, for different channels, uh, you know, it's usually dependent on the, um, uh, let's say you have RGB, for instance. Uh, the, the green color usually is, is highly correlated with the blue color or red color. So by doing this, like, you can model the nonlinear dependency between channels. Okay, so just more, a little bit, just a little bit more math. Okay, so we, we care about likelihood of, of the methods and we want to maximize likelihood. So let's say we define our sampling process. Okay, let's, let's go from the, the beginning. Let's define how we sample from this model. So we sample from a latent variable Z and that's defined our sampling process to be simply a deterministic transformation, invertible for sure, G over here, 
Okay, so what is the likelihood of a sample, sample from the data distribution under our model PX? Okay, so by the change of variable formula, we know that we can decompose this into two parts, which is the density of the pre-transformed uh, code and this determinant of a Jacobian term. Okay, and if we further define uh, the inverse function of G to be F, we see that we can just replace the G inverse with F here. Okay, so what it is doing over here is simply that we have an encoder, F. We encode it, and we want to regularize it using a prior distribution. We want, let's say, we, we, uh, we have data like MS or CIFAR, and we encode it using this F, and we want it to look like a prior distribution, like a Gaussian distribution, okay? And here, there's a regularizer of the entropy. We, we simply want the, uh, wants the latent code to be spread it out, to be spread out, okay? So this term says that the samples should be close to the mode of the prior distribution, like a Gaussian. This term says that we want the samples to be you know, spread out, all right? So it is sort of like, you know, for people who are familiar with VAE, this is similar, because like, uh, this is simply just an entropy term, and uh, there's no reconstruction term because it's invertible, so it's always zero reconstruction loss. All right, so intuitively, this is what happens. I have a data set, and I encode it into a latent space, and I want it to look like this shape, like a Gaussian distribution. So this is training time, okay? So training time, I encode my sample, this is data distribution, using this function, into the Z space, and I regularize it uh, using the loss I just introduced. And at inference time, if we want to generate samples, we go from the prior distribution and apply the transformation uh, F inverse, which is G, uh, our original definition, and we get samples that looks like the data distribution. Okay? So what this kind of, this kind of models can do, uh, here, um, Lauren, he simply just take some of the you know, test data, and we do some sort of interpolation in the latent space and see what happens when we decode it. Okay, so you have an encoder, and you, imp and, and you encode your data points into the latent space, and then you do some sort of interpolation in the latent space, and then you decode it using the inverse of the encoder. Uh, so this formula here is kind of ugly here. Uh, so it's simply because you know, for a Gaussian distribution, uh, what happens with high dimensional Gaussian distribution is that the probability within the ball around the center is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller when you increase the, the number of dimensions. And the probability of sampling from the shell is going to be larger. This is something known as the uh, concentration of measure, if you are interested, and you can simply just Google it. Uh, OK, so, so far so good. OK, I think I lost a lot of people. Uh, this is just uh, a paper that is uh, introduced on archive, uh, I think one or one month ago, Gillo by Kema and his friend. Uh, so in the paper introduced by Lo Hong in the previous slides, uh, they we we know like we we, de we decompose the data into two parts, and we want to condition the transformation of the second part on the first part. Okay, and you what they do is that they swap the partitions of these two parts. And then you can, con you can condition the transformation of the first part on the second part. Because this wrapping operation is, well, simply just permutation. And permutation doesn't, well, it is volume preserving, so you don't need to, you don't need to deal with that. What happens here is that uh, they introduce like a one, one by one convolution, which is sort of like a soft permutation of the channels, okay? And by simply doing this trick, they're able to uh, outperform Real MVP, which is the paper by Laurent in, in previous slides, by a well significant amount of you know nats, which is negative log likelihood. And if you look at the samples of the glow here, you can you can definitely tell the difference between the two methods. So the first one is the real MVP or nice introduced by Laurent, and here is the the new paper introduced by Kima. We see that simply by scaling up your 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 model and and using well deeper structure and more data and higher resolution and stuff, you are able to gets really good samples of human faces and really good samples with high quality of bedrooms. So you, you see that, well, that's impressive. You see that here, like, we don't have artifacts that's generated by, by real MVP, and, and here things are much more smooth and, and good quality in general. 
All right. Uh, so far, so good. I'm going to enter this last part of the talk. If you have questions, you better ask right now. Don't you, Kai? So um, the question is, if we don't have access to the Jacobian, what's going to happen, right? So in general, uh, if you want to follow the, the, the formula over here, this, uh, if you want to follow the, well, if you want to maximize the, the likelihood of your data under your model, you can use this formula. But if we cannot compute this, if it's you know sort of intractable, un untractable, um, well, if it's nasty in general to compute. Um, you can there there are tricks to estimate it, okay? You can you can estimate it, or or there's also things like uh, VAE for for instance, which is more like an approximate methods of the direct maximum maximum likelihood methods. Yeah, I mean there are all kinds of like at the beginning I introduced the the tree uh, of categories of general models. I mean there are different kinds of methods to approximate the likelihood. So when, what happens here is that you cannot compute the likelihood of your data under your model directly. So you, you need to do some sort of approximation. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Because like, what happens here if you don't have this term? Okay? What happens here is if you, inc you want to encode your data and you want, to, you want it to look like the, latent, uh, the, the prior distribution, this term guarantees that you were encoding won't collapse to the same solution. Let's say your prior distribution is a Gaussian ball. Okay? The first term over there is gonna is saying that you want, let's say, these are your encoding. Okay? You have three data points in your training data. What it says is that you want everything to go to the mode of the Gaussian distribution. Because it has higher likelihood and the, which means the, the global minimum is here. Okay? Without the second term, everything is going to collapse to the same solution. Yeah, this, the second term simply just says that uh, now my loss is two things. The first thing is that I want everything to go to the, the mode of the prior distribution. The second thing is that I want the entropy to be, to be large. I want to spread out. OK, because that's the gradient. OK, OK, OK. More questions? All right. So uh, this is a work that I did for this year's ICML, which is presented like three weeks ago. Uh, so in the previous two parts of the talk, we talked about autoregressive models and change variable models. And uh, we know that when we, when we are making modeling assumptions, like you know, for this factorization, for this ordering, let's say um, I assume the conditional probability is a Gaussian distribution. Um, then we are making some sort of assumption. With assumption comes bias and limitedness. And uh, for change of variable model, uh, I mentioned that in order to make sure that the computation of a Jacobian scales linearly in instead of cubically, uh, we are limiting ourselves to a subfamily of functions which, uh, with which we can compute Jacobian in linear time. So by doing this, we are also limiting ourselves to a smaller family of the, uh, functions and thus distributions. So there's like a trade-off between, you know, like I said, expressiveness and uh, uh, tractability. And here in this paper, we combine autoregressive models and change of variable models to have highly expressive distribution models with tractability, basically. So what is no autoregressive flows or NAF? Uh, so here, the first thing that we introduced in the paper is the concept of a uh, conditioner and a transformer, which is uh, below. So a conditioner is an autoregressive neural net. So an autoregressive neural net, like I said, is simply a conditional mapping. So I want the transformation here to be conditioned on the preceding variables or the pixels. Okay. So we have an autoregressive conditioner, and uh, we also have an invertible transformer, okay? So here, we want the mapping here to be invertible. So uh, we want to define as well, a, a kind of transformation which is as highly expressive as possible. So we're simply just throwing a neural net here. So here we have a nested neural net. But we want it to be invertible, that easy, okay? 
So for it to be invertible, uh, we simply need to have two criteria. Uh, one is that we want the weight to be positive, the weight of this nested network. And uh, the, the weights here are simply just outputs of the conditioner. So the conditioner is going to give us the, 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 the parameter of the transformation. Okay. And uh, I want the weight to be first positive, and I want to use strictly monotonic activation functions such as soft plus, ALU, uh, leaky ALU, your favorite sigmoid and 10 edge, etc. So in terms of math, what we have here is that we have a conditioner which outputs the parameter of the transformer, okay, and uh, with some constraints. That's it. So the overall transformation can be invertible. One instantiation is what is known as IAF by Kimano in 2016. They introduced a, an affine transformation, which is like nice and real MVP that you just saw a minute, a minute ago. So they have a conditional scale and conditional shift of this pixel. Okay, so the transformation of this pixel is conditioned on the preceding, preceding pixels. Okay, so. Uh, so we go from auto wasting model to what is known as the affine transformer, or what we call the affine autoregressive flows, and to neural autoregressive flow. Okay. So what happens when we introduce something to this model? Okay. If you think about it, uh, this is let's say this is like a uh, true data distribution. It's like a bivariate distribution that has this shape. And let's say we want to model this joint distribution using the autoregressive model, okay? So we assume the ordering, we, we take the ordering x1 and then x2. So we model the joint, the, the joint probability as a, as a product of conditionals. The first thing is the marginal probability of x1. The second thing is the conditional of x2 given x1, okay? So if this is the true data distribution, and it's clearly a bimodal distribution, what happens if we model it using a Gaussian? Okay, think about it for five seconds. What happens if the true data distribution looks like this, which is bimodal? What happens if we use a Gaussian distribution to model it? Okay. So what happens is that. Uh, If our data, I, I get many samples from the, this is a training set, okay? Okay, so if simply just use a Gaussian distribution to model the data distribution like this, we're gonna spread out the probability mass to, to give high likelihood to all of the data points, okay? So what happened is that I might allow a non-trivial amount of probability to some region that is not supported by the true data distribution. So that's why the joint probability is not accurately modeled by our autoregressive model, okay? So we can improve autoregressive model by stacking multiple layers of transformations using a fine autoregressive flow uh, with alternate ordering. So maybe in the first layer we are gonna have this conditioning in the second layer, we're going to have this conditioning so that condition on this axis, we can warp the probability, uh, the distribution of, of the input in a, uh, using a neural net. Okay, so, the, so basically we can use autoregressive, uh, we can use normalizing flow or change of variable models to improve the expressiveness of autoregressive models. That's the first thing I want to tell. The second thing is that we can improve a fine autoregressive transformation using a nonlinear transformation, okay? So in the, in the previous slides, I talked about a generic neural uh, transformer, and uh, we also talked about a specific case using a fine transformation, a fine transformer. We see that if we simply use a fine transformation, it fails to model multimodality, which is the first column over here, okay? So this is the target, this is the true data distribution. If we use these multiple layers, as many as we want to model that, we, don't, we, we, we fail to model the multimodality of the true distribution. Whereas if we use a neural transformer, transformer for instance, this is like a nonlinear function, which is monotonic, invertible for sure. Uh, the, in, in, uh, 
inflected point over here is going to help us to spread out the probability mass like into multiple modes. And that's why if we use a neural transformer, we have a better inductive bias for multimodality. Okay? So going from something linear to something nonlinear, we, we, we increase the expressiveness of the transformation. Okay? So there are two questions we want to ask uh, at the beginning. We want to have attractable uh, methods and want to have high expressiveness. So since this is an autoregressive transformation, we know that, well, the Jacobian of an autoregressive transformation is simply because, uh, so this is dy1, dx1, dy2, dx2, blah, 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 blah. and since the transformation of the first pixel doesn't depend on the preceding pixels, these are just zeros, okay? Because it's, because, because it's autoregressive, and these are also zeros. Okay, so the determinant of the Jacobian is simply just the product of the entries on the diagonal. So it's linear time computation uh, in the number of dimensions. So it's tractable. And the second thing that we did in the paper is that we proved a universal density approximation theorem for this kind of transformation methods. So it's highly tractable, well, linear time, and it's universally expressive. So we can model any kind of distribution on a real space. So just a bit of spoiler, what happens during training. So on the top left corner are the true data distribution. On the right is the affine autoregressive flows. And on the bottom are two special cases of NAF, neural autoregressive flows. And we see that, oh, sorry. We see that while AAF, affine transformer, fail, well, is struggling to, to, to model the true target distribution. Um, our, exam our special cases of NAF can, can uh, converge to the true, true distribution more efficiently and, and, and more uh, accurately. And we, we uh, also evaluate our methods on a suite of uh, data sets like uh, the, the electricity value of the household throughout the history. And these are images data as well. And we simply just maximize the likelihood of our data and evaluate on a test set. We see that across the board, we are outperforming other methods using affine transformation and other architectures as well. OK? So far, so good? OK. So the main takeaway here is that uh, autoregressive models and, and uh, change variable models are good. Because uh, we are also, like up until 2018, we are still improving the model in terms of the generation quality. Uh, like the, the paper of GLOW introduced by Kima one month ago, uh, we're able to generate samples of good quality, uh, efficiently as well. And we're, we're also able to guarantee that our model can have high, high expressiveness and also uh, tractability in terms of computation of the likelihood. And there are a lot of applications of these kind of methods, flow-based method, methods or change of variable methods, like uh, density uh, estimation, well, which is obvious, and density distillation. In RL, people use this, this kind of generative models to, to, to tell whether you are certain about these data points or you are uncertain about the data points to guide exploration in RL. Uh, we can use likelihood-based methods to do anomaly detection uh, or copular in statistics. And uh, uh, just some low-hanging fruits for people who are interested. Uh, in our paper, we, uh, we decompose the, the, the NAF into a transformer and a conditioner. So we can, do, we can try other kind of transformer so that you can use that as a journey model as well. And uh, you know, sampling from this kind of mo model is sequential because it's autoregressive. So maybe we can combine a uh, neural transformer with a you know, nice or real MVP-like uh, architecture so that the sampling process can be parallelized. All right, uh, so this is the end of the talk. I hope you get something from it. Thank you. Questions? Or, yeah, sure. Against, uh, usually, um, so I think there's like two papers or one paper, which is done in 2017, which use this kind of invertible methods, like NICE or real MVP. Uh, they use this kind of generator, which is invertible. 
and uh, they, they compare, compare maximum like, likelihood chaining with uh, GAN chaining, which is you know, a discriminator uh, min-max game. And uh, there's like a, um, it's sort of mysterious right now as, as in, you know, we don't know whether good likelihood would translate into good generation quality. All right, so, so in the paper, I think they show that uh, with good likelihood, you don't necessarily uh, have good quality. And with good quality, like in GANs, you, know, you, you don't necessarily have good likelihood estimate. So there's like a, um, a gap between the two things. And uh, also like in GANs, like there's no guarantee in terms of like the um, diversity of the samples you're gonna get, right? And, and with this kind of methods, usually you won't have uh, mood collapsing problems. Yeah, and, and what, what, what I like about it is that you can estimate the likelihood easier. And that can be a way to evaluate your methods. Yeah. More questions? Oh, by the way, like if you want to apply for grad school, you are free to talk to me. Well, because I'm I'm doing research right now at Mila. If you're interested. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Okay. Thank you. Maybe we can uh, we can have more discussion on the way uh, to the reception. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be hanging around. Yeah. Just thank you, Jingwei again. Thanks.